Okay, so as I mentioned, we are very pleased to welcome Mark Dunkerley back to the Wings Club to speak. He last spoke here in March of 2014, and of course, a lot has changed in the world since then. Mark, as you know, is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Hawaiian Airlines and its parent company, Hawaiian Holdings Incorporated. Hawaiian is actually in, the 80, in its 88th consecutive year of service. Uh, time does fly. Um, and is the biggest and longest serving airline in Hawaii. Mark joined Hawaiian in 2002 as President and Chief Operating Officer. And during his tenure, the airline has evolved from a niche leisure carrier to a strong and growing global pl player with a network that spans three continents. Hawaiian is the U.S. industry's leading airline, airline for operational performance and has consistently delivered the highest levels of customer service. In addition to his day job at Hawaiian, Mark also serves on the board of directors of Airlines for America, also known as A4A, and the National Air and Space Museum. Uh, he is also a member of the board of governors at IATA. Please join me in welcoming Mark Dunkley. Aloha, nice to see everybody. Aloha, that's right. Uh, thank you, Mary Ellen, and uh, as always, it's a great pleasure to be invited to address the Wings Club and to see uh, so many familiar faces uh, from uh, my now, my goodness, almost 30 years uh, in the industry. Uh, now, not so far from here, the legislative session is in full swing, and Hawaiian, much like uh, all other U.S. airlines, is spending time and energy trying to influence the outcome of the legislative process. Uh, we are explaining the virtues of those aspects of legislation that we believe are helpful. That's principally the reforming of the nation's antiquated air traffic control system, while trying to blunt the efforts to enact the legislation that harms us. I'm not going to use my time upon this pulpit to delve into the debates with which you're no doubt all familiar, but I would like to share some thoughts on why it has been so difficult to gain traction to the airline point of view. The fact is, airlines garner little sympathy at the moment, and this is coloring the acceptance of our agenda. Ideas that are truly good for the traveling public are being criticized for being airline friendly, while others that are bad for travelers are being promoted by special interests, largely on the basis that airlines hate them. The frustration among airline managements is palpable. In our own, in our own councils, we bemoan the myopia of those who promote a raft of rules and regulations that limit our ability to serve the needs of the traveling public. Absent from our lament is any notion that we might be at all responsible for this sad state of affairs, and that the public reaction to us, while not entirely logical, is nonetheless predictable. So where does the resistance come from? In my view, it comes from the narrowing of traveler choice. In fact, traveler choice is probably more limited today than at any time since the dawn of airline deregulation. My colleagues at Hawaiian have unearthed the following staggering statistics. With the concentration of over 80% of airline seats in the hands of just four carriers, we've arrived at a point where 70% of US domestic routes are monopolies. And only 10% of US domestic routes have more than two competitors. Typically, in big cities that serve as, as hubs for one of the dominant airlines, you'll see a broad array of routes served, but likely only one airline. In 16 of the 40 busiest US airports, a single carrier and its JV partners control more than two-thirds of total seats. By contrast, in communities that aren't big hubs, you might have more airlines to choose from but the number of flights has declined in the past 10 years. Consider that while the number of domestic routes served from the top 40 US airports has grown uh, by 5% over the last 10 years, it has decreased by 12% at the rest of, all, uh, rest of the US airports. Um, it's a feature of the human condition that when we feel we have little choice, our expectation of service providers change. For example, there are a plethora of clothing brands. All of us have shopped for clothes which, in the cold light of day, turn out not to fit quite
quite the way we expected or look quite as elegant as they did in the dressing room. We accept this as part of the vagaries of shopping for clothes. We don't blame the brand as much as we blame ourselves. At the other end of the spectrum are services that are natural monopolies. Pity the poor cable company. The only acceptable standard for the, in the world of cable TV is that there be 200 stations instantly available dedicated entirely to motorcycle customization from the moment that you depress your remote control. The standard we hold the cable provider to cannot be exceeded. They can only fail. Now, of course, there's a broad spectrum between the clothes brand and the cable company, and I'm not suggesting that airline service has now joined the cable service at the far end of that spectrum. But for a large number of travelers in this country and elsewhere, consolidation has moved the industry decisively along that path. So much so that I believe this narrowing of choice bears directly on the unhappiness of travelers. Faced with a paucity of choice, today's traveler arrives at the check-in, ready to find fault with every aspect of the journey. Add a crowded airport to a ponderous TSA line and the anxiety-promoting boarding process. Stir in ATC delays and perhaps an airline employee having a bad day, and we have the perfect recipe for that well-honed common, common garden variety airline gripe. So what's the answer? Changing the dynamic in our industry requires the reintroduction of choice for the consumer. And the best way of achieving this is for policymakers to create opportunities for smaller airlines and new entrants to challenge the dominance of the largest airlines. This would be a radical departure from the current trend in policymaking. Today, policy initiatives are almost uniformly aimed at imposing new sedimentary layers on a deepening burden of regulation in what is destined to be a futile quest to address perceived shortcomings of the traveler experience. Such regulatory fixes address the symptoms, not the disease. And unless and until policy focus shifts to addressing the lack of choice, this unhappiness is going to continue. Choice will only return if smaller airlines and the new entrants are given access to markets where barriers to entry, whether formal or simply practical, exist today. In prior speeches, I've addressed how regulators might address barriers in their review of joint ventures. Today, I'm going to uh, address the increasing problem of airport access. It's a truism that in most of the largest metropolitan areas, airport capacity has not grown as quickly as demand. Increasingly, airports are full, if not all throughout the day, uh, then certainly at those times of the day that are most attractive to travelers. This is most easily appreciated at airports where the ability to land and depart is governed by having a slot. If you don't have a slot, you're denied access, period. But even at airports where slots aren't the constraint, principally here in the United States, where only a handful of airports have a slot regime, it could be access to airport facilities that becomes no less binding a limitation. It would be our clear preference to see capacity increase at such airports. But in most communities, the prospect of airport capacity being built to keep pace with the demand to use it seems fatally remote. Accepting this, the most pressing public policy question becomes whether the existing rules governing the allocation of scarce capacity serve the public interest. They don't. Before I explain why, I should detail how the current rules work. The IATA slot allocation rules are applied at most airports. And these rules provide that so long as an airline has used the slot in the prior period, that airline can continue to enjoy the use of that slot going forward. Their rights are grandfathered in perpetuity so long as this, the slots are used. New slots or unused slots are returned to the slot pool for distribution. Under the IATA rules, 50% of the available slots are then distributed to new entrants on a 
uh, first come, first serve basis, and then under a complex mechanism to other applying airlines. On the face of it, these rules promote competition. By setting aside up to half of the slots available for new entrants, the consumer benefits of increased competition are acknowledged. So the theory goes. But they don't work. If there are no slots to be allocated in the first place, the IATA slot rules are irrelevant. The problem, in other words, isn't a defect in the algorithm, algorithm for the distribution of slots, but instead that there are no slots to allocate in the first place. This isn't about pl uh, providing a level playing field. It's about providing a playing field. At the margin, regulators have begun to stir themselves to this problem. In a number of cases involving mergers or JVs, they've extracted a slot price to be paid by the happy couple on their wedding day. A recent example of this would be the US government's insistence that, as a condition of approving the joint venture between Delta and Aeromexico, the combination be required to cough up 24 slot pairs in Mexico City. So it's clear that some regulators have recognized the need to take action when confronted by um, airlines seeking to further concentrate markets. This is laudable. But what they've not yet set themselves to is the circumstance where airports are full and the existing concentration of slots is denying consumers adequate choice. What we need is a policy approach for correcting this problem. In the first instance, we propose a change to the slot allocation rules. Before detailing them, we should first suggest the scope of the application of the new rules, and for this, we would start by looking at airport slot concentration. The US Department of Justice, much like other competition regulators, uses the widely accepted herfindahl hirschman Index as a measure of market concentration. The index is calculated by summing the squares of the market shares of the participants in the market. It's easily calculated, and by design, it takes account not just of the number of market participants, but of their relative size. DOJ publishes guidelines for what it considers problematic levels of concentration. Under its guidelines, HHI scores of less than 1,500 uh, indicate a competitive market. Those between 1,500 and 2,500 indicate a moderately, uh, moderately uh, cons concentrated market. And above 2,500, a very highly concentrated market. Competition authorities elsewhere have very similar guidelines. The EU, for example, considers HHI scores in excess of 2,000, the level below the uh, DOJ level, as being problematic. To be conservative, we'd propose that the new slot allocation rules apply in circumstances where the HHI index exceeds 2,500. And for the purposes of this calculation, airlines in an immunized joint venture would be treated as a single carrier. Congested airports which have such high levels of slot concentration include Istanbul, London, and Sydney, while those which would fall under the limit would include Incheon, Bangkok, and JFK. We would further limit the applicability of new slot allocation rules to the largest airports that demonstrate this very high level of concentration. And for this purpose, in the US, the definition of a large airport would be one with employments of over 11 million. At such very large, highly concentrated airports, we propose that the slot allocation rules be changed such that for each hour, at least 3% of the slots would be made available for distribution. In those instances where airports cannot generate new slots to meet the 3%, either through the return of unused slots or the creation of new ones, by lottery, 3% would then be taken from existing holders and returned to the pool for redistribution. This is a modest proposal which creates a number of virtuous incentives. First, airports and their airline users become powerfully motivated to find additional slot capacity to prevent the lottery from coming into effect in the first place. Recall that if 3% of the slots in a given hour can be made available either through slot returns or through slot growth, then there would be no sequestration. 
Second, airlines are encouraged to enter fortress hubs to provide a much needed competitive dynamic. Third, travelers will see increased travel choice, likely lowering fares and improving service offerings. Four, since new entrants are defined at, each, uh, at the level of each airport, the largest airlines are incentivized to grow their networks to places that they don't already serve, often the fortress hubs of their fellow dominant airlines. Networks become increasingly overlapped, generating more travel choices for travelers living not just in the hub cities, but also in the fringes of the networks. As I mentioned a little earlier, in this country, few airports employ the slot allocation mechanism to ration access. Sadly, this isn't to say that airport access is not an issue in our competitive landscape. Instead, access to airport facilities, principally gates, has become the limitation at the most congested airports. Again, those with employments in excess of 11 million and with HHI indexes in excess of 2,500. A couple of weeks ago, Robin Hayes of JetBlue pointed out that at Atlanta there are 193 gates, and yet JetBlue has only been allocated a single gate, which it must share. In our case, we've been moved from pillar to post by airports up and down the West Coast to accommodate the needs of our larger competitors. At Los Angeles, we've been moved four times in the last seven years. San Francisco, three times. Sometimes, we've been given better accommodation. Sometimes, we've been given worse. What is true always, however, is that in each case, we've been the last consideration in the reallocation of scarce space not the first. We are shoehorned in after the agendas are, of others are met, and I can tell you that the shoes are getting tighter and tighter. Domestically, access to airport facilities is the newly emerging frontier of competition. And I would suggest to you that airlines understand this far better today than do those who regulate us. As a keen observer of what our competitors are up to, I believe that the industrial logic underpinning the number of the mergers that have, uh, we've seen in our industry have been the benefits of controlling airport facilities. At the same time, at the busiest airports, airlines have been falling over themselves to invest in facility improvements in return for improving their position, not just in terms of the quality of the facilities, but also in terms of the real estate. Recently, American are now issued a release touting a $1.6 billion investment in improving LACs. No one disputes the need to see improvements in Los Angeles, but I'm sure the additional gates that were referenced in all of the publicity were more than a tangential element to American. For most of the last 40 years since airline deregulation, developments in our industry have taken us to new places not experienced before. The introduction of the hub and spoke network and the emergence of the low cost carrier is a potent force to name but two. But that's now changing. The consolidation of the industry has more of a back to the future quality to it. Dominant airlines the world over find themselves in a position to deny market access to competitors in ways not seen since the internet destroyed the ability of legacy airlines to control distribution in the 1990s. Through mergers and alliances, they've acquired market power. By controlling airport slots and gates, they're building formidable barriers to competitive entry. Where such physical barriers don't exist, they're seeking to use political means to insulate themselves from competition, as the brouhaha over the Middle East carriers demonstrates. Inexorably, the huge benefits of airline deregulation are being pulled away, leaving the tra traveling public dispirited and unhappy. It is time for the policymakers to recognize the threat and to take decisive steps to ensure that airlines can compete and that airline, and, and that airline customers can enjoy choice. Mahalo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Good to tee up a little controversy and insight there. We do have time for a couple of questions, if anyone would like to pose some questions to Mark. Milan. Yes, Jennifer Clay, Jetliner Cabins. 
Um, you were talking about choice. Uh, how important is the premium economy extra comfort class? On some of your wide bodies, you have extra comfort premium economy class, and on the Boeing uh, wide bodies, you don't at Hawaiian Airlines. What is the future strategy for a class, a hybrid class, like premium economy? Uh, in, in our network, premium economy has been enormously successful. Uh, when we reconfigured our uh, A330s, we um, uh, added uh, a, a, an additional 24 seats to that cabin in order to meet the demand. And today, uh, we're in an in extraordinary position where our paid load factor in premium economy and indeed in our business first is not materially different from what it is in our full economy section. So we're big fans of it. The fact that we haven't done it with our Boeing 767s is more a function of the fact that uh, a, a great aircraft though it is, it is a type that will be leaving our fleet um, uh, within about a year and so uh, we, we couldn't justify the investment of, of, of putting uh, additional seating configuration investments into that aircraft before. Um, given that Delta, American, and United are stepping up, up their lobbying efforts in opposition to the Gulf carriers, um, and hoping to find a friendly audience in the Trump administration. Are, are you and some of the other smaller carriers uh, planning your own efforts? Well, I think it's Hawaiian and some of the other bigger carriers. We've got uh, FedEx and UPS uh, uh, very firmly um, uh, supporting an, an, an opposing view. Um, I, from our perspective, I can speak to, to Hawaiian Airlines. Um, from our perspective, uh, we uh, we want to see as liberal an operating regime for carriers as possible. We're a small carrier, we have ambitions to grow. We think that in a, uh, in a world in which we can apply our competitiveness um, uh, it, in, in markets, we're ultimately going to be able to win and, and grow and develop. Um, therefore, uh, we're very concerned when we see any, uh, any move towards constraining uh, open access, in this case um, by, uh, by the efforts to have the U.S. Uh, repudiate the Open Skies Agreement with these three countries. Um, we, we believe these, um, these countries, we believe very strongly that in the world of open skies, uh, U.S. carriers, U.S. consumers benefit far more than uh, they disbenefit, uh, and we think the notion that uh, we can surgically um, uh, deal with um, with open skies as a concept in certain geographies while leaving it unblemished in other geographies, uh, I, I think is fanciful.